The Wild West of Wind Panel took place April 6, 2023, in the Flatirons campus. I'm Ernie Tucker from the Communications Office. Joining me then were a panel of wind experts I had interviewed for NREL's Clean Energy Innovators book. First was someone who needed no introduction because we were in his auditorium, Emeritus researcher Bob Thresher. Bob came to the Solar Energy Research Institute, SERI, in 1984 and continues to make an impact nearly four decades later. Actually, none of the panelists needed any introduction. First was researcher and offshore wind authority, Walt Musial. Walt arrived at SERI in 1988, shortly before his friend, Wind Laboratory Program Manager Brian Smith. There's also Group Manager Amy Robertson, who has been at NREL since 2010. She was the lab's first dedicated offshore wind researcher. Growing up, she wanted to be an astronaut, but after a few nauseating rides on her dad's NASA gyroscopic flight simulators, she changed her goal. Now she says she just wants to be a lab rat. Sue Hawk, a wind pioneer whose more than 30 year career began in 1979, was unfortunately sick and couldn't be with us. Paul Veers, a senior research fellow, spent many years at Sandia National Labs before coming here in 2010. Sandy Butterfield, another early wind leader, joined us from Maine via Teams. Also, Bob Noun from Florida was uh, part of the discussion, listening in, and Bob was an early wind leader as well. I thanked Shelley Nyman and Carol Laurie for organizing this panel, Craig Myers from IT for Streaming, and Center Director Daniel Laird for hosting the meeting. As I wrote in the introduction to Clean Energy Innovators, the book was never intended to be a definitive history. Instead, it is a collection of stories I have written over the years. Uh, they were re-edited at the request of laboratory director Martin Keller so that five chapters trace the arc of our renewable technologies in the words of the various pioneers. For the wind chapter, I was fortunate enough to stumble across members of the University of Massachusetts Amherst Wind Mafia. Brian, Walt, and Sandy, who along with Bob and Sue were present at the earliest stages of significant wind energy development, as was Paul. Those visionaries and others pursued a crazy dream to power the world by wind. Amy added her perspective on the impacts of these people, as well as where things are headed now in the field. Paul Veers in the book gave me a very simple description of a wind turbine. It's a piece of machinery that takes energy in one form and makes it electricity. It sounds pretty simple. According to the Energy Information Agency, in January 2023, the U.S. produced 141 gigawatts of electricity from wind, 12% of the U.S. total electricity generation. There are now 42 states with utility scale wind power plants. This growth is amazing considering that prior to 2000, US wind energy production was negligible. The US now produces about 22% of the world's wind energy. But mere decades ago, only dreamers and schemers thought that this would be possible. So let's go back in time. On the panel, I asked Bob what triggered him to enter the wind field. His answer was similar to the one he gave me in the Innovator's book. He said that the global oil embargo in 1973 made him angry. That wasn't his exact words, but you can imagine. And he hasn't gotten over it. I sat in a gas line for five or six hours, as many other people did. I just didn't see any reason why we should be dependent on other people. It seemed like we should be able to produce our own energy one way or another. 
As for how he was lured to Surrey in 1984 by Bob Noun from his spot as Oregon State professor, the answer was twofold. First, Bob was in the middle of grading papers, so the call came at the right time. He also brought a new perspective and a hunger for ideas, as he said in the book. If I did anything, I guess I came in with a fresh look. We evolved away from the big machines and started working with the embryonic small wind industry that was building wind farms in California. Around the same time, a new gold rush was booming out there in the Golden State, where the Wild West of wind really began thanks to a combination of federal and state tax incentives, a requirements for utilities to make long-term purchases of alternative energies, and an abundance of natural resources. Brian described his first day on the job at a wind farm in Palm Springs, California in 1984, a job several friends had turned down, but the hungry 25-year-old engineer driving a rusty Volkswagen, Volkswagen Rabbit needed money. A shadow flashed over Brian's shoulder as he walked the 210-acre Mava Wind Park near Palm Springs, California. It was 1984, fresh out of a master's program at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. It was Smith's first day on the job as chief engineer and his boss was showing him the layout of the wind farm, home to more than 100 windmills, as Smith called them then, located in Southern California's windy San Gorgonio Pass. A minute later, another silhouette flashed behind him. Startled, Smith looked up, then turned to his boss, who shrugged and said, somewhat too nonchalantly for Smith, those are blades flying off the turbines. The 20 foot long fiberglass projectiles were airborne daggers. We have a fix in, the boss said, but for now, the wind turbines have to keep turning to sell power, even though the technology is a little shaky. In those days of the Wild West, many machines failed and runaways, that is turbines with blades spinning out of control, were common, as were the ones that crashed to the ground. Brian oversaw a variety of impromptu fixes, including purchasing a crossbow to shoot a rope attached to an arrow through the blades in order for the rope to catch the blades and eventually slow down the runaway and stop it. Likewise, Walt walked into a job as a 25-year-old at Energy Services, Inc., ESI, in product support in Boulder. Working for Sandy, but soon ended up their man in Altamont Pass. With little or no safety training, and helmets were optional, Walt was often tasked with climbing up narrow metal ladders on turbines. He was clipped to a rope. That almost proved fatal one day. As he told the panel, a coworker on the ground accidentally let go of the rope's end, and the rope tangled in a turning turbine blade. Let's hear what happened next to Walt. He's like pulling the rope, but then I look down and he's not, he doesn't even have the rope. The rope's <coughs> caught in the rotor and it's, and it's winding itself up as, and it's pulling on my belt. And, and I'm, and so I'm really getting pulled into the rotor. So I had to like run, like run up the ladder real fast, unclip the tagline and, uh, and then I was, I was fine, but. People have kind of perished in that way too. But between the, the um, infinite force of the rotor turning and and the, and me and you're un yeah. unable to clip off. Quite a few belt. people died. During people the, have yeah, uh, a variety of, of gruesome ways. But one guy who should have died but didn't <laughs> was was he the was he the Danish guy? Uh, and shout out to my friend Tim Jorgensen here who. Uh, is visiting and, and grew up on a farm in Nebraska and is Danish. So I, I had to, have to you know, acknowledge him. But was he the guy that took the four by four by eight uh, log? Or how did how did that work? Yeah, it, um, that actually the, the technician was not Danish. Um, the machine was. Uh, but so one of the machines that um, was on my wind farm uh, was a Nor tank, a Danish turbine, 65 kilowatt, 
and it had a long low speed shaft attached to the rotor and the gearbox and uh when they ran away they, they really were they hadn't um tried the uh bow and arrow approach um what they would do and this was created by the danes they go out to the lumber store they'd buy a green four by four they would haul it up inside the turbine and uh, then they would wedge it um, as a lever arm between the, the spinning shaft and the bed plate. And if, if you did it right, you timed it right, um, you could bring the rotor to a stop even if it was spinning too fast. Uh, but this guy was kind of a, a rookie. He was unfamiliar working with these machines and he got it too close to a, a coupling that had bolts on it. And so um, uh, the four by four hit a coupling and it just went whack on his chest. Fortunately, I had a belt on, it just bent him back. Um, but when they, they came in to work uh, at the end of the day, he, he looked like he was hurting a little bit. And I said, well, what's up? And he opened up his shirt and he had this huge bruise on his chest. And, and that's where I use my power to um, stop using a green four by four <laughs> to uh, stop runaways and just say, let it run away. So there were advances in, in safety. <laughs> I, I tech, uh, yes, uh, common sense comes in life before uh, uh, machine. machine, yeah. yeah. Um, Sandy, I don't know whether you can hear us, but um, I believe you your first day uh, on the job here at Sari. Can you hear hear me, Sandy? Uh, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, right. Can you tell that story? I I believe you were supposed to meet uh, a TV crew from Denver your first day here. Yeah, that's right. You have it exactly right. I remember right out of graduate school, I, I was hired by, uh, well, I was hired to come to this brand new lab that uh, Jimmy Carter had set up. And uh, and I was very excited about that, the Wild West. I'd never gone east of the border of Massachusetts, I think, by then. And, uh, or excuse me, west. And uh, so I arrive uh, bright and early. Uh, I, my job is to sort of talk to the press and, and uh uh, perhaps a little add a little color. So we arrive uh, at, at sunrise, right, with, the, with the, the the whole camera crew ready to get uh, these shots of this beautiful turbine. It was a French turbine, the Arawat, uh, and we drive in, and uh, the camera crew is all set up. The turbine is on the ground, and, uh, <laughs> and and that became our testing mode. I remember the, I was there, let's see, this is 1977 and uh, through 1980 when I left to start ESI. Um, and uh, we decided that uh, shortly thereafter, there was really no point in adding instrumentation to a machine that hadn't made it through a windstorm. So first, first test was, does it make it through a windstorm? And 50% of them didn't. So. <laughs> I, uh, uh, the American wind taco is one of the, the bicycle wheel that folds. I think there's, there's just, there's uh, story after story about, uh, about how these machines fail. And we became quite, uh, I think quite, quite excited about, uh, uh, destructive testing as a mode, as a realistic and re reasonable mode of, of testing, uh, because you'd understand where the weak points were It's the quickest way to find out where the design weaknesses were. So, uh, and then. And Walt, I think Walt and his team became one of the masters at destructive testing. And said, "They look, we don't we don't test unless we uh, unless we can break the damn blade or break the gearbox." And so we love breaking gearboxes. We, I've been breaking gearboxes my entire life. I'm going to get into that. We're at about nine thirty-five. We have about twenty-five minutes left, and I think we want to have a, a question and answer period. Um, so I'm I'm going to try and rattle through this. As I said. Initially, we're going to run over. We have too much stuff to talk about. But um, uh, Sandy, gearboxes were your thing. Um, and and I, I just kind of uh, want you to talk a little bit about the 90s uh, advances there and, and why were gearboxes such a big problem for you guys to take, for all researchers to tackle? Um, okay, well, there's 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 way too much to talk about here. 
I'm not sure if, <laughs> as John can speak. Um, I, I mentioned that I've been breaking gearboxes my my whole life, um, and and it started with ESI. And in that particular machine, we had a break on the high speed shaft. In fact, on the back side of the motor, and um, and boy, we knew how to put applied torque. But uh, that poor gearbox was was the was the the recipient of that torque. Um, one of the one of the uh, uh, brakes that we tried was an electromechanical brake. We this was applying uh, uh, drag to the brake through shorting the generator, essentially, like uh, electronically. And uh, Dan Dan Handman was one of the test engineers who was uh, tried the initial test. It was his brainchild. Uh, he was testing it at our, our manufacturing lab out in Illinois. And I remember getting this call, and the poor guy was crying. Uh, and he was describing how how the whole turbo was on the ground. As soon as he hit the brake, the torque was so great that it actually ripped the gearbox right off of its foundation and the whole drivetrain, rotor, gearbox, generator, the whole mess came to the ground. Anyway, and 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 we got better at it than that. I mean, we, we know how to break gearboxes. But I, you know, the industry was suffering. Uh, even the so, so-called more mature industry in the '90s, where we thought, ah, we know how to make machines and gearboxes that last. It was the Danish industry, the U.S. industry. Nobody escaped. Um, and at one point, it almost caused the uh, uh, one of the largest manufacturers of gearboxes in Germany to to uh, file for bankruptcy. Uh, and I think that at some point, you know, Walt and Brian and um, uh, Bob Arakello, uh, there's several others who were deeply involved with analyzing what was the failure, the motive failure, and and uh, manufacturers and the uh, uh, the gearbox suppliers and the and the owners uh, were all at odds on the legal front, and uh, and nobody wanted to step up and say what they knew. But uh, I think Walt and Brian and uh, Bob Arakello accurately said, uh, look, there's, there's a lot of problems in here and there's no one single offender. And uh, from that, we said, well, look, there's obviously, we don't understand the design process. The entire, there's something uh, that we're missing way back in the origins. Is it loads? Is it uh, the design? Is it uh, lubrication, bearing design, load path, et cetera? And we finally said, look, it's, we really need to test the entire process, starting from the design uh, board, and 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 from that we uh, we agreed that, uh, the the gearbox reliability collaborative would be born, and we the uh, the Nash the NREL and DOE would sit in the center of this and say, well, we're going to test this. If you any participant wants to participate and see what we learn, well, then you have to come to the table and share what you know. And so at first there was a few reluctant owners that came in and said, well, okay. Um, and that just grew to the point where we were having uh, the leading experts in tribology and bearing design, uh, gearbox design, uh, um, owners, all of the owners were involved. And it, it, it was obviously an important thing because gearboxes were only lasting three to four, maybe five years on a good one. And some would last a very long time, but those are the ones that were had uh, unaffordably expensive gearboxes. So, um, so we and so we that whole program grew, and obviously it's a uh, it's still going. It's now called the Drivetrain Reliability Collaborative. But I, uh, my my takeaway was there's that there's a lot of moving parts in there, and the best way to uh, design a reliable drivetrain is to get rid of the gearbox, and that's what gave birth to the idea of direct drive. For me and someone who had a good idea, I thought. Um, but anyway, and I, so you all know the rest of that history pretty well. Well, uh, I want to say something about the the Wild West part of this because that was, uh, if you go back twenty years from from where we started, we didn't even think gearboxes were important. We, we thought the um, we thought the gear industry was a hundred years old and it was a mature industry, so that when designers were just buying off the shelf gearboxes and sticking them up on bed plates and calling it a wind turbine. And when, and I was, I was really surprised when we got to NREL or Siri back in 88, there weren't any machine people here. Everybody was working on rotors. We called them rotor heads. And, uh, and, and 
you know, being in the field for five years, we realized that we understood the rotor pretty well, but we didn't understand the machine at all. Mm -hmm. And and when we, but at that part of history, you know, the 88, that was about the worst moment in time for the gear wind turbine relationships. All the gear companies were suing all the wind companies and vice versa. And the gear companies say, you misrepresented the loads. You, you didn't tell us that it was going to be this severe. We didn't, we had no idea what we were getting into. You, you let us on. The wind industry was saying, well, you sold us a faulty product that does, didn't meet the specifications and they just were like at each other. And so um, that was when we, like one of the first things I did when we got here, we formed the, um, the standards, the, the gear standards committee uh, in like the early, like 1990, you know, and that's, this was the people that Sandy was mentioning. Bob Arakello was one of the, from the gear side, whether it was Arakello, Ed Halbeck, Don McVitie, we called them the gear gods, and they were the they were the three gear experts that that didn't like they, they weren't trying to like kill us. They were trying to work with us, and they helped us form this collaboration with the gear industry, and that that made a huge difference. And that that's still going, I think. The the gear standards. I don't I, you know but that's that that made a huge difference because we got we were all got to sit down at the table together and start working out the problems. See, see well, I think you're missing one obvious thing that Brian pointed out to me. He, it, it, it was much simpler a uh, fix. He said, uh, if you had an emergency, you prayed. Bob, this must have been music to your ears because uh, tell me again why you thought you'd take a chance on these two guys. And, uh, what did they bring to you guys here at Sari? They brought the experience from the wind farm. And we, at Surrey, in that time, we needed people that knew the machines. We were just starting to work with the industry. Uh, this was the Reagan years. Budgets were tight. We focused on keeping the industry alive. So at least I, the wreck was for one person. But <laughs> I stretched it a bit to bring both of them in. We needed the help. And well, neither one of us could fill one person, so you had an idea too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, have to, uh, I have to thank Bob for hiring me as well. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Sandy. Oh. Oh, I just um, wanted to say that I, I wanted to thank Bob for hiring me. I think I, when we when we sold ESI, uh, I was looking around for a job and and uh, and couldn't work for another competitor because of a. a crazy thing that I signed and uh, and uh, Bob called me up one day and say how about coming to work for us and it was like music to my ears it was great because I was getting the chance to he was gave me the chance to work on every single one of the huge pile of problems that that surfaced during the ESI days and starting with aerodynamics and stall and and leading edge roughness and uh, uh, you know and and Gearboxes. I mean, it was just, it was, it, I was like a kid in a candy store. It was crazy. So it was, thank you, Bob, for hiring me and, and, uh, and trusting me. <laughs> I, I figured you'd be mad at me because I stuck you with taking down the Mod 2. Well, that didn't last long, did it? <laughs> that, that only took six months. Oh, pitch bearings. Why did the pitch bearings go? I don't know, but it's going to cost $2 million per machine. And and uh, there were three machines, so that's six million dollars. And I think that year, the whole budget for the entire DOE program was eight million. So that was that was the, the 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 solution was obvious. You take the machines down and go work on something that you can afford. Which well, I thought eight million dollars was a pretty fantastic budget coming from ESI. Um, jumping ahead. Uh, you didn't stop there. Machines got bigger and uh, offshore wind became a new thing. Um, Amy, could you talk a little bit about uh, what drew you to offshore wind and <laughs> what the, what the heck is going to happen? Uh, it's so much promise, but right now we have basically Block Island and some things out there. But what what drew you to offshore wind? Well, First, I think it's, I don't think I ever shared this with you, but actually my husband, what first drew me to wind was my husband actually also went to UMass and also oh. studied wind um, in the again, same the department, mafia again. same yeah. professors. He, um, 
left after a year though, because we were dating and um, NREL was actually funding him um, for his PhD work mm. and the government uh, delays as always uh, kind of delayed his PhD funding. He's like, this is ridiculous. I can't get, you know, my NREL to, to pay for my PhD. He's like, I'm giving up, you know, Amy's back in Colorado. I'm gonna go be with Amy. So um, <laughs> that was his failed attempt to get a, a PhD at, at, at UMass, but that, spurred my my interest and in, in knowledge of, of wind and so when I got this opportunity to apply to, to NREL it was for offshore wind and I started looking into it and it sounded like a fascinating uh, concept I, I got of course hired to to build to design um, software for the support structures of fixed bottom offshore wind systems but I hired on the day I hired on they're like oh there's this new floating wind project happening why don't you go go figure that out Amy and it was the best opportunity ever because I think floating wind is just like the most crazy idea and like complex mechanical system out there that's just fascinating um yeah engineering problem to solve and, and fun so yeah floating wind is is the wind turbines you put out in the really deep water in the U.S. we have a lot of that so we're, we're trying to be kind of leaders in that area and it's just a, a crazy dynamics problem that's fun to solve so yeah, we're, we're just starting now in the U.S. with fixed bottom like the rest of the, the world with fixed bottom coming first, but we're, we're really gearing up for that floating wind industry. So we've, we've been working on it quite a while and, and now finally seeing it come to fruition. Um, for all of us here, um, um, and, and thanks for that, um, there's areas that you told me about where the research and industry are focused now. I mean, that's obviously one of them. <coughs> Uh, three bullet points were validating multiple wind technologies at scale to achieve an integrated energy system, developing taller wind turbines with larger uh, resources to capture wind resources at higher elevations, and lowering the, the levelized cost. And then uh, here comes Paul Veers with his grand challenges of wind energy uh, in December and pointed out there's, there's other things that need to be uh, addressed. Uh, uh, efficiently and affordably deploying wind plants at larger scales in diverse landscapes and in deep water offshore will be extremely challenging. Is is that you know code word for boy? We don't have a clue yet, and this is going to be tough. It's, it's mostly that we don't have a clue yet. But I think um, it's really that there's a lot of lack of deep understanding about what's going on, rather than learning from. It's similar to what we did before, so I think we can do this a little bit bigger and we kind of push our way along that way. I think uh, listening to this conversation and, and watching this group from, from the outside, I stayed at Sandia Labs for a long time and worked with them from a different lab. I think uh, what you're hearing and, and what they've talked about is a fundamental approach that was key to making wind successful. I think they, this group up here are people who looked at the system. They didn't say, oh, I'm an aerodynamicist. I'm going to solve aerodynamics problems and I'm going to work forward. Or I'm a gearhead and I'm going to solve gear problems and work forward. They said, what does the system need? What's the key problem here? What's the innovation that we have to go forward? And looked at that. I mean, it, I mean the example is when Sandia Labs started looking at wind energy in the 70s, they built a, a wind turbine, a vertical axis one, that had the aerodynamic properties to make torque. Stuck it on one of the office buildings, started running it, then someone said, oh, maybe we should check if the structure is strong enough. And stuck a strain gauge on it, and the thing was almost failing every time it went around. So they took it off the administration building, put it, you know, a mile out in the desert, and then they started to, to test it out there. I mean, there was always this tension about, are we working on my piece of problem? I think the way Bob approached this and, and, and Walt and Brian and Sandy as well, I think was 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 admirable because they didn't kind of get stuck in those those spots. Look at what's the system problem. And that's what Amy's talking about here too. And when you look at this offshore thing, I don't just need to make it float. It's a whole system now that's floating. So I've got impacts everywhere in the system. I, do that. I mean, it, it takes, I think, a mindset like that to really push technology forward. Well, you do realize we had the benefit of Walt's training in a pickle factory. <laughs> it's broad training. He, he, gave, he gave up pickle research for... Uh, yeah. Amy's an astronaut. Yeah. I, I know it's dairy farm. Yeah. Yeah. We got a, a little things. That was a job of necessity. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, we are sadly closing down to the final few minutes. Uh, um, I, I want to open it up to questions if there are any. Uh, but uh, Bob, you you had said to me um, your um, source of renewable energy is is uh, interacting with the young staff and things, and you say. I teach them old tricks and they teach me new tricks. Uh, what tricks are people teaching you now? And, and then we'll just, uh, if anyone has questions, please raise your hand or shout them out. Or whatever. Well, I think uh, in the way of problem solving, uh, we were taking some very simple methods, building machines, scaling, learning almost by trial and error. Mm -hmm. Now, the the computer capabilities and the analysis capabilities of the younger staff are really let us see ahead where the problems might be. Mm -hmm. So I think we're really uh, changing the way we, we do the design. Analyzing it much more thoroughly. We built machines with not understanding anything about it dynamic loads, basically. So no wonder we had problems. <laughs> I would add that something about the new generation coming in has the ability to do amazingly complicated computational models very quickly, which is great. And I think the thing I would try to feed back is, can you also do a three degree of freedom model? <laughs> because it's going to reveal things that your computational model is going to hide. From you. So I think if you can get the two ends of that, Bob's old trick, you know, what's your simple model? You just a couple of years later, add the new one, you know, beat it to death, with the computational model. You've got something there. Yeah, thanks, really Bob. Awesome. It's huge. Um, yeah, that's important. Um, anybody have any questions for the panel, the folks? I think we have a pretty hard stop at 11 something, don't we? That meeting was moved, so we don't. We don't. This is great news. Must have been Amy's um, meeting. Okay. Um, uh, I do have. I do know. Uh, my friend Tim does have a question. And uh, Tim, do you want to? Do you want to raise it now? I, I don't remember the question, but I do have another question. Because wind in rural America, wind sells, right? You talk to very conservative farmers; they understand wind. So, is there any application like these pivots? A lot of them are generated by electricity. So on a real kind of ground level, is there any research and development going on to for farmers to be able to power these pivots, which they they get that, right? You don't have to sell that. So is there any R&D going on on that scale? Because I know you guys, it's big scale. And it's been fascinating for me to participate in it. Amazing. But uh, anything going on on that level? I think I would pass to Ian on this one. He's the one that's the, the guru and what we call distributed win. So the answer is yes. Um, but it's really taking the, the learning from what we've seen here and applying it to the turbines that the industry has moved past um, because the pivots need a 250 kilowatt unit, not a multi megawatt one. And so that and combined with storage to address torque, startup torque loading. Um, for the center central irrigation pivots, so certainly things that people are working on it hasn't been widely deployed, but it's market space. By the way, for those of you with your own copy, Ian's story is on <laughs> is in here too. So you know, I'm just saying. But uh, the, the question that we were talking, Tim drove me here. Uh, was uh, he grew up on a farm in Nebraska and black. at the, the windmills and things. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay. this is <laughs> yeah. Um, any small wind, uh, you know, in farms still using it to pump water for cattle? Is, is, is small wind a, a part of our discussions at all? I mean, at, at any scale? Yeah, no, certainly. And, and there's a lot of, of kind of renewed interest, especially when you when you look at resiliency. Um, so fires and things of that nature. The, the kind of the, the local energy system, whether that be a 10 kilowatt wind turbine on a small farm, um, all the way up to, to residential wind turbines or small residential wind turbines. Again, following the same thing, computational analysis, certification standards, making sure they work before they fall down, 
um, all of that kind of stuff that, that the people here on this panel championed as we develop larger turbines and, and applying that now to smaller turbines for different applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Um, I read somewhere, was it Paul in, in your uh, grand challenges or something that one of the goals uh, out there is wind energy making up 50% of the U.S. wind or U.S. Uh, renewable generation. Is that a, a, a target that you can foresee uh, happening? Yeah, it's not my own. I mean, I think if you look around the world at, at projections of how we get from where we are in our energy system to a, a carbon-free energy system, um, 100 years from now, there's a lot of paths we could take. But if you got 20 years or 30 years to get from where we are to where we need to be, there are only two major sources of energy that can replace the fossil fuel uh, majority that's out there right now, and that's wind and solar. And we've got a big chunk of nuclear, but that can't move quickly either. So if you look at the projections, we're going to keep the nuclear we've got, which maybe is about 20%, and the rest of it has to come from some combination of wind and solar, which puts you right in the neighborhood of 30 to 50% of each. I don't know how it's going to play out, but we're going to have to be in the neighborhood of 50% of our electrical generation to decarbonize that sector. And once we get past that, you have fuels and hard to decarbonize sectors, the, the energy sector as a whole, we have to decarbonize, which means wind has to go even farther. It's a huge shift from where we are right now. And that's just here in the U.S., right? It, it is here in the U.S., but that's going to have to be duplicated everywhere where there's uh, significant infrastructure. Hey, Daniel, you're there. You, you know stuff about this. You have anything to add that you'd like to talk about? Yeah, I don't know if it was Wild West. Maybe the guns were still smoking. <laughs> kind of when I started, but uh, maybe the Wild West part, it, it, uh, it cooled off. Um, well, certainly Paul and I worked a lot on that uh, topic, right? And uh, as he said, if you're just saying someday in the future, there are a lot of paths to get there. But if we are going to try to get, we're going to try to achieve the current administration's energy goals, then, then wind has to grow rapidly. So it's, I mean, you could argue whether it's 30, 40, or 50 percent of our energy wind, but I think the bigger issue, which Paul briefly alluded to, is to decarbonize transportation and sort of general industrial decarbonization, you know, steel production, various chemicals. That means the amount of electricity needed maybe two to three times what it is today. So the percentage needs to go up, but the size of the pie, if you want to think of it that way, may need to be three times as big. What, uh, give us a quick take on how that would happen. I mean, Bigger tur terminal uh, uh, turbines, uh, more more of them, smarter configuration. Probably yes to all of that, and you can get opinions all the way uh, up and down the table there. Uh, you know, something that I think a lot about is we uh, obviously you you start where you have the best chance of success. So the the places with great wind resources. Um, that are relatively close to existing transmission have already been um, developed, right? Or exploited, if you want to call it that. So when we talk about these really big increases, we have to deploy in areas where the wind resource is a bit more mediocre, closer to cities and uh, maybe competing land use, et cetera. So uh, there are a lot of things which I don't think have been as much of a constraint up to this date that are going to grow pretty rapidly. Uh, obviously, environmental impacts have to be addressed. Uh, if we want wind energy to be 10 times as big, we obviously don't want 10 times the wildlife impact. So, yeah, there's, there's uh, a long list of yeah. um, answers to that question. Well, I, I was talking to Tim on my way up here, and I, I noted that the uh, Pickleball courts in Congress Park in Denver have been <laughs> shut down because of noise. You know the little pock pock pock. Um, but is 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 noise an issue too that we're still grappling with? And as it becomes more proximate to urban areas, or if you were to push into areas, 
I could try. I, I think it's bigger than, than noise. It's really the, the social structure of how wind integrates. Into it. What does the community view as this? Is this something imposed on them that they didn't want in the first place? Is this something that adds value to their community? And if I can hear something that I don't want to hear, it's annoying to me. I don't care how soft it is. If that pickleball is not what I'm doing, mm -hmm. I want it out of there. You can do it. That's the same with the wind turbine. They're very quiet, but you can hear them. And if you didn't want to hear it, you don't want it there. Yeah. They're very tall. If you can see it and you didn't want to see it, you're going to not like it. That's the whole structure of that social interaction. Yeah. And just to follow up on that general topic, I mean, there are, uh, there are areas, right, where maybe a local jurisdiction or county says we want bigger setbacks so basically they're they're making it harder more difficult to deploy wind and then sometimes you get uh, uh, the opposite direction at the state level where they say we don't want these local jurisdictions impeding renewable energy so we're going to override them um, and basically facilitate you know we'll say wind energy development I have, yeah, that causes me a lot of heartburn, right? Because again, if the local community thinks this is just being imposed on us and we don't even get to vote or, or voice our opinions, that's that's not going to be good. Uh, I don't think for anybody working in wind. So uh, I understand the state level. Uh, you know, the states often have their own renewable standards or goals, so they're they're trying to facilitate that. But I think that could backfire. Longer term. Ernie, can I change the beat here for a second? Absolutely. I just wanted to share a couple of Bobisms. Um, <laughs> maybe some others have Bobisms, but uh, uh, with Bob Noun and Bob Thresher, uh, they hired me. Um, I've taken um, a lot of advice uh, from Bob Doc Thresher and uh, I attribute all my mistakes to uh, following Bob's advice, but uh, uh, first advice I'd recommend people consider is uh, uh, be careful what you do um, well, or what what is, how do don't you interpret that? Don't get good at one? something you don't want to do. That's, yeah, he told me that too. <laughs> don't get good at something you don't want to do. Yep. Right, because you'll be asked to do it. Um, and I made that mistake over and over and over again. <laughs> Most of us do. That's right. Uh, the other Bobism that uh, I think is good for us all to think about is uh, the three P's of success at NRO. Passion, patience, and persistence. And, um, you know, oftentimes, whether we're uh, been here for a while or new, come to Bob, struggling with what's going on. Bob, how, how can I be successful here at, at work? And Bob throws out the three P's. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has any uh, Bobisms uh, that you could share. Sandy, you must you have one. Have nothing to do with competence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got a couple of, I've got a couple. I remember meeting Bob when he was working for the Department of Energy. And, uh, and, and I think, uh, he uh, he's always wearing black turtleneck jerseys, and I and I can't find black turtleneck jerseys anymore. So, but I've been trying to, and I'm following in his footsteps. Uh, but one of his one of his famous terms was, uh, "Don't let the turkeys get you down," because at DOE there was it's just a a steady long line of turkeys with bad ideas coming in trying to get money. And uh, so, but but I think that it, it 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 quickly morphed into almost everything. Don't let the turkeys get you down, and uh, the three Ps. I the think corollary, Bob, though, Sandy, is, is uh, you can outlast them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but at the time, Bob didn't know that. <laughs> and so I think we learned by example, and I think Bob's example of, of the three Ps has been, a, has been an inspiration for me. So I uh, appreciate you sticking with it, Bob. And I, I, I always think about you whenever I'm sort of up against something that's tough. And uh, I think, well... You know, you, you stick with it, figure it out, bring in people that are smarter than you to help and um, uh, and you can work it away. But, I, you know, I, I wanted to just make a huge call out to the uh, to the young folks 
that are entering our industry. I think one of the most enjoyable things for me for my career has been working with people who uh, were hardworking, smart, didn't know what they didn't know, but were willing to figure it out. And I think we hired a lot of those people. A lot of them are sitting in the room. You see, well, I, when I was starting out, one of the first few folks that I hired was was Walt there. And uh, I think even Brian, even Brian, I think worked for ESI at one point. Um, so there's uh, Brian McNiff, uh, someone who you see on the pictures there, I think is another guy who's been with the industry for his entire career. Um, and so I think, you know, there's, I see Sean in the room there, I, uh, Sean Chang. I see uh, 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 Jason Cottrell, Jason Yonkman, uh, just folks who have been, you know, they, they hit the ground right out of graduate school and didn't know what they didn't know. I said, given them a possible problem and they, uh, and they whittled away at it and got it done. Um, you know, Jason, Jason Yonkman, I, I credit him with kind of completely revamping um, the basic codes that we used for design and uh, I, fast, for example, I mean, how many iterations of fast and yet the entire design process hinges around codes exactly like this, if not that exact code. So, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, our abilities to, well, the contributions that all of these young people have made to the industry um, are, are hard to trace back because there's so many, but they've They've changed the industry and they've enabled the industry. So I'd say if you think that what you're doing is not important, think again, it will have a monumental, uh, most likely it'll have a monumental impact on the industry over time. Well said, that was great. Uh, any more questions? Not online, nothing? I was wondering, Walt, what were some of the advice that Bob gave you that were career limiting? <laughs> <laughs> well, the one, besides the ones that have been said, I, I, Bob created this metaphor, and I think it was it applies to a lot of things. He said, "Don't don't pave the the roads until you know where the people are going to drive, or or the people are going to walk." So so like, I think that's uh, an over planning thing, or maybe. A, uh, but I think that applies to a lot of things we do. You, you, sometimes you have to, you don't, you have to live with uncertainty until you realize uh, where the, where you're gonna, where you're gonna end up. <laughs> so, and I, I think that is that why we yeah, don't have any sidewalks out here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I rely on that a lot because sometimes you, you know, we're we're sitting here and everybody's freaking out because they wanna, they wanna know where we're going and. So, you don't know yet, you know, just just relax a little bit and, and wait and see, you know. Well, and I think Bob has, is known for being very kind and, and generous and nice, but he's got a pretty sharp wit and was once asked uh, if one group we were working with wasn't too fixated on the details to see the, the bigger picture. So someone asked Bob, or, do you think they're missing the forest for the trees? And Bob said, are you kidding? They're looking at the bark. <laughs> <laughs> so elevate your view. Look at the big picture. All right. Well, I think uh, we've covered a lot. There's a lot more we could cover, but thanks all. Paul, Walt, Brian, Amy, Sandy, uh, Bob Nown, if you're there, and this guy. So thanks for, thanks for lending us your auditorium today. So. <laughs>